one of the reasons we should really care is because we actually don't know the long-term impacts of modern invasive species. You can't just swoop in and save animals. You can't just toss them snacks or rush to stop a control program just because it feels wrong. Unless you're a trained expert and you've got real evidence-based reasoning backing you up, chances are you're doing more harm than good. We've all seen it. Someone sees a cute animal in trouble, gets emotional, and suddenly conservation plans unravel. Trust me, I've seen plenty while digging into today's topic. Hold that thought. I need a coffee refill. Oh, and while I'm at it, this is your friendly nudge to hit that like button if you tend to forget at the end of the video. Thanks. So, rewind to 1997. Italy, the National Wildlife Institute teams up with the University of Turin. They put together a plan to eliminate gray squirrels. Yes, the chubby-cheeked cuties from North America that are, biologically speaking, biodiversity wrecking balls. The idea, get rid of the invaders, give native species like the red squirrel a fighting chance. Everything was ready to go. But then, boom, legal challenge. Some passionate animal rights groups dragged the plan into court. The entire operation was frozen in place. By the time the scientists finally got legal clearance in 2000, it was too late. The grey squirrels had already spread so far that any eradication efforts were basically useless. Or in official language, not practical. And now, biologists predict grey squirrels will keep spreading across mainland Europe, France, Switzerland, beyond. The chance to stop them missed it. Look, biologists can sound heartless when they talk about eradicating invasive species, but it's not because they hate animals, it's because they understand ecosystems. And when an invader shows up, cute or not, it can unravel the whole food web. This little fuzzball, yep, the grey squirrel, is actually ranked among the world's most aggressive invasive species. First brought over from the US about 140 years ago, it's taken over massive swaths of the UK and now threatens to do the same to continental Europe. In northern Italy alone, they've already claimed nearly 770 square miles of territory, squeezing out native red squirrels and threatening to leap the border into France and Switzerland. And it all started with just a handful. In 1948, two squirrels from Washington DC were released in Piedmont. In 1966, five more were let loose in Genoa. Another batch in 1994. That one was actually captured a couple years later, but the damage was already done. These critters don't need big numbers to launch a takeover. In most cases, just 10 individuals are enough to establish a new population and start reshaping an entire ecosystem. Between 1970 and 2010, Italy's red squirrel population dropped by a brutal 62%, roughly 650 square miles of vanished habitat. Meanwhile, the grey squirrel exploded across the landscape. For two decades, their spread was slow. Then they hit the gas. The real kicker, these invaders are climate flexible. Whether it's the cooler forests of the north or the warmer woodlands down south, the grey squirrel adapts fast, which spells disaster for red squirrels that were already in trouble across Europe. And let's not forget the economic damage. Because invasive species don't just mess with nature, they cost people real money too. Invasive grey squirrels are wreaking havoc on the UK's forests and commercial woodlands. These fuzzy little invaders might look cute, but they have a destructive side, especially when it comes to trees. They strip bark off trunks, exposing the inner layers and turning healthy wood into a breeding ground for fungi and insects. The damage hits hardest on hardwoods, reducing timber quality and slashing economic value. There's something nastier, squirrel pox virus. Gray squirrels carry it like nothing's wrong. 
they're immune. But red squirrels, they catch it, suffer horrifically, and die fast. We're talking scabs on their face, paws and genitals, with death often arriving before you even know they were sick. You rarely see a sick red squirrel. You see them either alive or already gone. And just to drive the point home, grey squirrels also raid bird nests. Why? Sometimes for the eggs. Sometimes for the chicks. They'll eat whatever they can get their paws on. At this point, it's too late for total eradication. All we can do is map their spread and brace for impact. Current projections suggest they'll reach the Western Alps between 2026 and 2036. France might fall between 2066 and 2071. Switzerland, possibly by 2051. But if things speed up, which, judging by the UK, is more than likely, we might see them take over continental Europe much faster than anyone expected. Culling? Sure, you can try. You might win a few square miles back. But it won't last. These squirrels reproduce like wildfire. Wipe out a few, and more will take their place. That's not a strategy. That's a bandage on a bullet wound. Bullet wound. Now, here's where it gets really ironic. Some animal rights activists, driven by compassion but not ecology, have made things worse. Way worse. Flashback to May 8th, 2015. A group stormed into a Chinese restaurant in Dublin, opened the lobster tank, and rescued the animals. They carried them to nearby Clontarf, by the sea, and released them into the wild, Sounds noble, right? Well, those lobsters probably didn't make it past the first tide. Cold Irish waters aren't exactly the Caribbean. These lobsters were bred for warm seas, not freezing unfamiliar depths. Dropping them into the Irish Sea is like sending a Florida retiree to live in an Alaskan blizzard, without a jacket. That's the paradox, isn't it? In trying to save lives, we often doom them. Emotion-driven decisions feel right. But without the science to back them up, they can unleash consequences far beyond what anyone anticipated. Without a fierce fight for survival, most relocated animals don't stand a chance. The predators are unfamiliar. The prey, even weirder. And don't get me started on local diseases they've never encountered before. Odds are, those rescued lobsters from Dublin probably died faster than if they'd ended up boiled and served with lemon butter. But let's play devil's advocate for a second. What if, somehow, the lobsters did survive? Well, then we have a different problem. A bigger one. That means animal rights activists didn't just save a few crustaceans. They introduced an invasive species into a fragile ecosystem that never asked for it. And if history teaches us anything, it's that these well-intentioned actions often backfire hard. Case in point, did you know certain crustaceans, like shrimp, lobsters and crabs, can reproduce without mating? No need for couples therapy or dating apps. Just one lone female and boom. A population explosion. Sounds like science fiction, but it's not. Take the marbled crayfish, for example. Back in 1995, a biology student picked up a batch at a pet fair in Frankfurt. The label said, Texas crayfish. But something was off. The creatures started multiplying. Fast, too fast. The student, clearly in over his head, passed them on to friends. Some were dumped into rivers. Others flushed down toilets, and from there, things escalated. What followed wasn't quite an apocalypse, but it was close. These crayfish spread across Germany, crept into most of mainland Europe, and even made their way to Madagascar, where the freshwater ecosystems are incredibly unique and incredibly vulnerable. When scientists started investigating the invasion, they were floored. These crayfish weren't just prolific breeders. They were biological copy machines. 
clones. Every marbled crayfish alive today is a genetic replica of the original female. One animal, one cell, endless offspring, like cancer in crustacean form. Each of them breeds up to four times a year. And since there's no need for males, nothing slows them down. A single female can found an empire of millions, all genetically identical, all capable of doing the exact same thing. In Germany, officials offer a small bounty for each marbled crayfish caught. The reward is intentionally low, because if it were higher, some people might start farming them just to cash in. They're so abundant, you don't even need gear. Just stroll into a park, switch on a flashlight, and within an hour you could scoop up over 150 with your bare hands. It's easier than picking mushrooms. And a lot more unsettling. In Madagascar, where they showed up around 2007, their numbers now stretch into the millions. Local freshwater species are being pushed to the brink. The balance is tipping, fast, and they're not alone. Louisiana crawfish, too, have become a global headache, overrunning waters in Egypt, Kenya, South Africa, and parts of Europe. They wreck native fish populations, compete for resources, and unravel aquatic ecosystems like it's their mission. So what happens when well-meaning activists rescue these animals? In 2017, a pair of them released hundreds of lobsters and crabs into the ocean near Brighton, UK. They were meant to be eaten. Instead, they were set free, without anyone bothering to check what species they actually were. Turns out, many were American lobsters, a known invasive species in British waters. Oops, intentions, noble, consequences, Ecological chaos. Dumping lobsters into the sea might sound like a noble act. But in Brighton, it wasn't just illegal. It was flat-out damaging. Sure, the intention was good. Setting animals free instead of letting them end up as someone's dinner. But next time, maybe read the regulations first. Or at least Google environmental impact of invasive species. To be fair, the two folks in Brighton weren't exactly card-carrying animal rights activists. They were taking part in a Buddhist ceremony known as life release, where animals bound for slaughter are spared and returned to the wild. Beautiful in theory, but in practice, the police weren't feeling the Zen. Authorities hit the pair with over $20,000 in fines, and even that was just the beginning. Local agencies spent around $23,000 trying to recapture those invasive lobsters. They only managed to retrieve half. The rest vanished into the chilly British waters, potentially ready to wreak havoc on the ecosystem. But here's a plot twist worthy of a nature documentary. There might be one creature that can save Europe from the rising tide of invasive crustaceans. Now, don't get me wrong, protecting animals is a noble goal, but it only works when it's rooted in ecological reality, not wishful thinking. In fact, there's a blueprint for doing this right. Let's jump to Fort Worth, Texas, where conservationists and animal advocates teamed up to handle a feral pig problem. Instead of button heads, they shared information, agreed on humane solutions, and worked out a strategy that actually made a difference without turning the ecosystem into a war zone. The result? Fewer pigs, less damage, and more peace. Because, brace yourself, science and compassion can actually coexist when folks talk to each other instead of yelling. So before, we canonize swans as the sacred protectors of park ponds. Maybe let's check in with the ecologists first. And hey, if you made it this far, you know what to do. Smash that like button, and I'll see you in the next video.